Hello. Hi. Welcome to the next episode of the Brio in the Box podcast. Pleasure to be here. Today, we're happy <laughs> to be able to feature our Brio Plus grass-fed collagen back in stock. Yay. Yay. We were having some supply chain issues getting that nice grass-fed collagen back, but we finally got our shipment in. Uh, I'm happy to have it in my coffee here this morning. Collagen, good for hair, skin, nails, bone health. 50% of the dry weight of bone is collagen. The minerals attached to that matrix. Tendons, joints, ligaments, all that good stuff. All your parts. Get it in you. Get it in you. So today we're going to talk about abs. Abs. <laughs> <laughs> abs. Why? What's the deal? Why everybody wants abs? How to get them? How to show them? Mm -hmm. <laughs> how to find them in there? Yeah. So let's start talking about like, like why abs? Why yeah. is of all the body parts that people are like mostly obsessed with? Mm -hmm. Why abs? I know it's a weird, it's a weird one. Mm -hmm. Whenever, whenever people like go to flex anything, it always is the stuff in the front, right? Like yeah. people go to flex, someone says flex, they flex their bicep. Or if you like lift up your shirt and flex your abs, it's always the the front end stuff. Yeah. And there's like so many books, you know, on like yeah. belly fat and like always in my like ads on, you know, social media and stuff, it's like this diet to like reduce your belly fat and like all this kind of stuff. It's never like how to get more defined calves. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I like, could use that book. That's, that's what I need. I think you have to get into a real niche level of bodybuilding before people care about the yeah. leanness of any other particular body part. I remember hearing that Arnold Schwarzenegger used to stand in knee deep water to do photos because he was super <laughs> self-conscious of his calves. I didn't know that. Yeah. That's funny. <laughs> so, okay. Why abs? Well, I think from like an evolutionary perspective, things that we generally find attractive that are like, they're signs of, um, youth, health, fertility, Yep. Those are the kinds of things that we generally gravitate towards as attractive. So, you know, a, a lean or flat belly tells you that there's not a lot of visceral fat accumulation around the organs as opposed to sort of a protruding belly. Um, that's a sign of poor metabolic health. Mm -hmm. And there are um, really, really accurate measurements better than BMI to tell you about your body weight distribution of either your waist to height ratio. Your waist should be less than half your height or even better as waist to hip ratio. So in men, it needs to be no bigger than one to one. Your waist and your hip measurement should be the same. Your waist shouldn't be bigger than your hips. Right. And in women, it should be 0.8. So women's waist measurement, just because our curves and hips are a little different shaped, right. your waist measurement should be 0.8 or 80% of the measurement of your hips. Mm -hmm. So I guess when we gravitate towards, you know, people are always flat belly diet and yeah. <laughs> that kind of stuff. So there's um, tells you something about metabolic health, good, yeah. um, healthy fat distribution. And interestingly enough, like in most groups, like fitness, health or whatever, those are the things we're attracted to. But there are some groups out there where being big is a sign of like <coughs> wealth, right? So, uh, like a Samoan sort of tribe, like the, the chief would always have like a big belly because he was the first to eat and he was like the, like mm -hmm. the wealthy, like well-fed guy. Yeah. So it's not that it's every single society, but like modern humans for the most part yeah. are drawn to the health factors. Yeah. I mean, I certainly there's cultures that have developed like very extreme versions of things that they valued as mm -hmm. like beauty or held up as their desirable aesthetic standards. Um, but in general, yeah. the kinds of things we're attracted to indicate, you know, health and youth and fertility basically. Yeah. Um, the flat belly thing also I think has to do with gut health. Right. So if you have, poor gut health and you're chronically inflamed in your gut or like heavy on the gas and bloating that also makes your belly protrude, which tells you something because there's such a, a serious interaction of the gut and the rest of the body, the gut and the brain in particular, that if you have a, a chronically bloated stomach, that that's also an indication of underlying poor health. Mm -hmm. So I think those are two maybe reasons we don't ever, these are all things that are happening like subconsciously, Yeah, you know, like why are we attracted to these different qualities and then the abs themselves being able to see them I think is just a sign of of leanness yeah. right not being accumulating ex excess body fat and then whatever healthy level of body fat we do have it's in other places it's subcutaneous in the you know women will tend to carry it in our hips and our butt and our legs more so than um in the middle yeah so kind of healthier weight distribution is considered more subcutaneous on the lower body yeah 
So I guess that's why the world, Western world is like obsessed with abs. Yeah. I think we're drawn to like hyper exaggerated versions of whatever we find appealing, right? Mm -hmm. Like, um, you know, you can have abs that you can see, but they're not like crazy chiseled. And so bodybuilders tend to want the like super crazy chiseled, like they stick out massive, like Mm -hmm. there's veins and it's just like extreme, extreme version version of whatever. Same with like super big breast implants or big lip injections or whatever. Right. We're we're, we're constantly exaggerating the like, you know, things Mm -hmm. that we find desirable. Yeah. A healthy person, right. Um, with a normal amount of body fat percentage, like for guys, like, you know, anywhere in the like 12 to 15% range is like quite fairly lean. Mm -hmm. And usually it's around there that you start to see visible abs for guys. Mm -hmm. And then those bodybuilders, well, like fitness models and stuff will get kind of like eight to 10%, um, which is like, it's still reasonable for some people, but often your performance starts to drop, right? Your ability to actually do um, you know, athletic and pursuits. You get well, mood and hormone imbalances. Yeah, too too it starts to have negative effects. Um, and then when you get into like the stage bodybuilder guys where they're like 3% or 5%, um, that's when you're like, you can't maintain that for very long. It's mm-hmm. super unhealthy. Um, if I've seen like on Instagram and stuff like that where people were like, this is what 0% body fat looks like. <laughs> if you have 0% body fat, you're dead you you've had your brain removed yeah because you literally can't be alive <laughs> so it's impossible to be zero percent body fat i think the lowest like accurately measured one was somewhere around three percent or so and mm-hmm. this guy was like all veins and just like tight skin it was crazy yeah um so we're you know ideally for guys somewhere in the like 10 to 15 percent range is like quite good mm-hmm. um once you get above 15 is is pretty hard to start it's pretty hard to see any mm-hmm. kind of abs at all. Um, women, it's a higher percentage because right? yeah. women tend to carry more body yeah. fat. Women tend to, we carry more body fat to make and feed babies. So yeah. a lean body fat percentage for a woman is like between 15 and 20. Yeah. Normal female would be like 25 to maybe 30% and then above 30% body fat is considered overweight or obese. Right. Um, but I want to make a point when we're talking about percentage of body fat We're talking about it from like a legitimate DEXA scan perspective. The, you know, skin fold calipers, the in-body bioimpedance scanners, all those kinds of things will underestimate percentage of body fat by between five and 7%. So people will go get these like, you know, low quality body fat measurements and they're like, oh, I'm 7% body fat. No, you're not. (laughs) (laughs) Go pay to get a DEXA scan. You'll see a much more accurate, realistic measurement. It's like, you're supposed to have fat. That's yeah. it's good. It's healthy. It's a For sure. uh, metabolically active hormonal organ. It's a, it's an important part of the function of your body. So it's not supposed to be yeah. super, super low. I remember a long time ago, Pat Sherwood talking about how often people will want to look a certain way, but then as soon as, if they get there, their performance significantly drops because they're, they just can't, perf- he says for him personally, he performs better at a higher body fat percentage than he would like to walk around at, mm-hmm. but he is more, you know, performance based than aesthetic. So for him, it's worth having an extra couple of percent, mm-hmm. um, just so he can feel good and perform well. I remember seeing a video of Matt Frazier and he's like <laughs> sitting on this box and he's talking about Craig Ritchie from yeah. the team Ritchie YouTube channel. Also love they're great. Um, but so Matt Fraser's sitting there and he's like grabbing his belly and he's got like a pretty good amount of fat on his belly. And he's like, I don't know why I always have this. He's like, I don't have lean abs like that Craig Ritchie because yeah. Craig's like super shredded. But I just thought that was funny. So you got like, like dominant athlete, fittest man in the world. And he wasn't super lean and shredded like a cover of, you know, men's health magazine yeah. kind of model or anything. Two different yeah. things, performance sure. and aesthetics. For sure. Some people do tend to be able to get leaner than others and mm-hmm. still perform, <clears throat> excuse me, like Noah Olson has like crazy popping abs all the time, mm-hmm. right? Matt Frazier um, doesn't, but that's just how they're, how they are, right? Yeah. So some, some of it's going to be um, training related. Some of it's going to be genetics just yeah, in the way in sure. where you carry your body fat. And then the rest of it's going to be like diet and lifestyle yeah. related. It's funny. So I remember Atlas, he would have been like maybe five, he was little and seeing an ad on TV for some like ab trainer, like infomercial type thing. It was all about these abs. And he looked at me and he goes, you have those. (laughs) And I'm like, yeah. And he was like, 
you could see that he was like having this moment of like putting together like, yeah. hey, that's a thing on the TV. And like all these adults that I hang out with have those, yeah. <laughs> you know, and he was kind of like, what's going on here? And now that he's 11 and, you know, trains like a gymnast and trains CrossFit, he's got little kid abs on him. And it's like a thing like yeah his little best badge of armor for his, sure. his, his little best friend is always like atlas has abs you guys <laughs> and he's always like telling all their friends on behalf of him and Atlas is just so embarrassed right because it's not like he's out there like flashing yeah. lifting his shirt up it's in grade six or anything but like the kids they start to notice right and they're yep. they're getting those for better or for worse they're getting those messages from media and society about like hey this is like a thing yeah it's definitely a thing that a lot of people desire, but few are willing to actually like put the work in to get it. And, yeah. we'll, and we'll get to the process eventually, but let's talk about the structure of the abs, like how do abs actually work? Okay. So the core, the core is a, a unit of muscles around the middle, literally at the core. That's why it's called that. So core muscles go all the way around. So you have your yeah. spinal erectors on the back, you know, obliques and, um, serratus muscles around the sides. And then you have the like actual rectus abdominis, the six pack muscles yep. that go down the front. There's also the transverse abdominis in there. That's responsible for puffing out your belly or sucking it in. Yep. So layers of muscle. And if you ever look at an anatomy drawing, the, the abdominal muscles are, they look like, like guy wires, like a suspension bridge. So they're built to anchor the spine. The spine is basically like a stack of oranges. If you think of like little Christmas oranges all stacked up. So it, it's wobbly, right? Because we need to have some movement, mm -hmm. but we also mostly need to prevent movement at the spine. We need to protect the spinal cord, but we have to, there's this trade off, right? If our spine was super rigid, we wouldn't be able to like get out of bed or yeah. even really run very well or like anything lift. Or like we need to be able to move our spine a bit, but we need to protect the spinal cord. Um, so the primary role of the abdominals is to resist movement around the spine, right. which is the opposite of what most people think. When they think of training your abs, they think of crunches and sit-ups and flexion. They think of flexing the spine, which is not the primary role of the abdominal muscles. They can, they can yeah. do that. You can sit up and that's your abs. You do the workout Annie and you have sore abs <laughs> the next day. Yeah. Um, but the primary role, the literal definition, um, core strength, is synonymous with the ability to resist or recover from undo flexion and hyperextension of the spine, resist and recover into a good position or maintain a good position. So keeping that in mind, the, the way you train abs isn't primarily through sit-ups. If yep. the abs were meant to be flexors, they would look like bulgy round little muscles like biceps, right? right? They would, that's a bicep is a flexor, flexes the elbow. It's got this round little muscle belly meant for primarily flexion. Right. The abs aren't built like that. They're mostly flat. They run in all different directions, depending on the layer to, to anchor the spine to the hips, to the mm -hmm. pelvis. So then from your perspective, as the guy that does all the programming, yeah. what are the big primary movements that train the core? So I remember years and years ago, um, reading about a study they did and they compared, um, doing heavy lifting movements like back squats and deadlifts to some of the like ab specific training methodologies, right? Um, and they they found there was more abdominal activation doing back squats and deadlifts than there was in like the the Bosu planks and sit ups and stuff like that. So um, traditionally, people always think, oh, I got to do my abs, I got to do like my knee raises and my leg raises and my sit ups and stuff. And yes, like that works. But if you look at a week's worth of programming you're going to get way more movements um, that are just static on the abdominals. And that's where most of the training comes from, right? Every time we squat, every time we hold a, an object over our head, um, farmer carries, um, any kind of movement where our spine isn't necessarily flexing and extending, you're still getting abdominal training. Which is the majority of the movements we do. Yeah. How many thousands of times a day do we tell yeah. people like, Stabilize, brace, like don't round your back, lift your chest up, like all those things where we're, yeah. so big primary ways you train the abs. Primary ways are like Dead planks, lift. heavy, heavy lifting, um, any kind of like static hold type stuff, um, like yoke carries, all that kind of stuff. It's all tons in the core, right? So deadlifts, back squats, I would say would be the big two. For sure. Heavy overhead movements. Yeah. Never is the role of the abdominals more important than when yeah. you're putting big weights overhead. Yeah. Resisting that urge to flare your ribs out and keeping it locked down so you don't put undue stress on your back. Yeah. So the big lifts, the classic lifts. For sure. 
Uh, that's part of why actually, so powerlifting is back squat, bench press and deadlift in CrossFit. We do like the CrossFit total is, um, back squat, standing strict press and deadlift for a couple different reasons. And one of them is the major role of the core in the standing press, as opposed to laying down to lift weights. Right. <laughs> the other one is complete range of motion at the shoulder, but, right. um, incorporating the abs much more into there. And then, like you said, the stabilizer ones, yep. so planks, we do lots of planks. Farmer carries, yoke carries, things where you're stabilizing your core. And as soon as you do that, like even when you take a bar out of the rack to back squat, you feel yeah. whoop, all your abs like organize themselves mm -hmm. into the position they need to be. Yeah. And this, it has to do with like the breathing as well, right? Like often we'll people will take a big breath and kind of like, like clench, right? And that's that core contraction. That's that like stability within the core so that you're ready to squat. You hold it in, you, you know, hold it in until you're standing up or some people will exhale or grunt as they're standing up, but it's all about that core contraction before you do the lifting. Intra-abdominal pressure. Yes. I'm always trying to get people to make more noise. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're the total opposite of whatever gym that is where they ring the lunk alarm. If you grunt while you're lifting, it's like, I'm going to ring a bell if you do it and I'm happy for you. You know, it's like, yes, <laughs> but it does actually. So grunting, yeah. um, I saw a study, it was in tennis players, weightlifters, um, and maybe like a volleyball serve. There was a few different like high power athletic movements and the athletes that grunt are able to generate 10% more power. Yeah. I saw another one as well where they compared, um, grunting versus not grunting. I'm pretty sure it was just in, in some sort of weightlifting movement, but they also found that if you're, if you like to grunt, you do better grunting and when forced not to grunt, their performance dropped. Mm. But then if somebody doesn't like grunting, their performance dropped when they started grunting because they felt it uncomfortable. Feels silly. Yeah, they feel <laughs> silly. And so they're like, they're less uh -huh. able to try hard, right? I feel it, it's like the same as mirrors, right? Some yeah. people like mirrors. And so if they can see themselves, they're going to try real hard. They're going to be like, yeah, look at that shit. <laughs> Some people are like, I don't want to see myself. And if you put a mirror in front of them, they're going to back off. So they don't make those crazy faces and yeah. whatever. Right. I do not want to watch what my face looks like. <laughs> while I work out. It's, I've seen some photos. It's not good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm no. in love with her uh, open photos and stuff. I've never once made a cool face while <laughs> working out for sure. Okay. So we got like, if you wanted to, if you're like, I feel like my core is weak. Yeah. The things you would add on to, you know, train your core to get it up to par would not be more sit-ups and crunches and V-ups and stuff yeah. like that. It would be planks, you know, farmer carries. Obviously you can't overdo it with like the heavy lifting too mm -hmm. frequently, but I feel like you could do planks every day. Yeah, for sure. And that would be fine. You yeah. Know? It's just, it's less pressure on your spine, right? If you're, if you're doing extra sit-ups every single day, like mm -hmm. you are risking a spinal injury, right? Like yeah. spinal, um, Mike Tyson, shout out. Um, you, you don't want to do sit-ups every single day, right? You can do some sit-ups and it's fine. Um, uh, but you're way better off mixing in planks or, you know, farmer carries or some sort of static hold that's going to still strengthen your core without the excessive flexion extension. Yeah. Train Even the primary purpose of the abs. I think, think of it like a piece of metal. And if you bend and flex and yeah. bend and flex and bend and flex and bend and flex over and over every day, eventually you create a weak point and then you'll go to like pick up a pencil and uh, yeah. throw your back out something stupid. Even the GHD sit up, you know, the goal with the GHD sit up is as you're leaning back, as you're eccentrically loading those muscles, your spine is meant to stay neutral, flat, right? Yeah. You're, you're, you're moving from the hips more than anything else, which is why to initiate the movement, you like squeeze the quads and like shoot everything up so that you're not doing these like massive flexions and extensions. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, if you're going to do extra ab stuff, it should be mostly static, um, holds and, and bracing, mm -hmm. and then a little bit of accessory, you know, movement. Mm -hmm. And we've been having the belt discussion mm -hmm. a fair bit lately. And, uh, actually I just taught a level one seminar recently and in the deadlift lecture, somebody asked me about belts and I went, ah, oh, I'm glad you asked that question. We've been having this discussion a lot lately in the gym. So you, your core needs to get strong and it does that under, under decently heavy load. So yeah. those muscles need to learn how to do their job, just like any other muscle or movement pattern or whatever. You got to learn how to do it correctly. Good mechanics. Yeah. A belt has its place for sure, but it can't be all the time. Yeah. It's a crutch. It's an accessory. It's literally an accessory that we need to have the core doing its job up to a certain point. Mm -hmm. My threshold, I don't bring out the belt until I'm over 90% yeah. of my lifts. So the last set of back squats or the attempt at a one rep max or the last heavy clean and jerk, um, 
Other than that, I want my core to do the work itself. And since I stopped relying on my belt so much years ago, my, and it takes a lot of work and it takes a lot of humility and check the ego and only handle weights that I can move properly. But I finally am at a point in my life where I live without back pain (laughs) all the time where I did for years and years when I was training heavy and just eight handfuls of a leave every day, which is not a good idea. And, And I do the same when I belt. And for me, it's like, it's such a treat, you know, if I'm doing like, you know, seven sets of one back squat or whatever. And I go to my fifth or sixth set with no belt. And it's like, okay, that last one felt really freaking heavy. Like I barely got it. As soon as you throw that belt on, like, yeah, you've got this like boost, right? Mm-hmm. And now your, your last ones, they just feel stronger, but you're still benefiting from the like core mm-hmm. strengthening part of the, the previous sets. The yeah. other thing with belts too, is like how tight you have them. Yeah. They're not supposed to be so tight. You can barely breathe. You know, they're supposed to like just, you know, keep everything contained so you can push against them. But if you're like mm-hmm. cinching it up to the point where it's like, you can't even like exhale. Um, you can't get any core activation. Yeah, then you've turned exactly. off. You've turned everything you off worse. And, and you're relying hundred percent on the belt, which is not the goal. The goal is like an accessory. You know? mm-hmm. It's one extra layer of abs. Yeah. At some point we'll do a whole podcast on performance enhancers. Yeah. <laughs> not that kind. Not that kind. <laughs> the belt and caffeine kind. That's not, not the kind that really works. <laughs> <laughs> the not allowed ones. Yeah. The, the ones that we are allowed. And actually speaking of the kind that really work, um, when, when bodybuilders are trying to lean out, right. As you lose weight, as you like lean out, you do naturally reduce muscle as well. Right. And that's often why bodybuilders will, will use steroids is that it minimizes the amount of muscle loss while you're leaning out, right? It mm-hmm. tends to make it so you're you're using more abs. So like they just do, they're the wonder drug apparently and they do everything. Yeah. There, there's a strong call in body, well, this is a tangent, but um, we've, if you follow bodybuilding r- roughly, you'll notice if you go back to like the seventies big, like the Arnold Schwarzenegger kind of thing where the guys were very lean in yeah. their middle. It was that V taper, big wide back, quite small in the waist. Now you have these guys with these big, mm-hmm. like, um, Big turtle bellies, shell yeah. bellies. Yeah. Kind of pot bellies, like abs on the outside, but they, apparently that's from abusing growth hormone. Yeah. So abusing some of those drugs doesn't. And like, even from the judging perspective in bodybuilding, there's a call for like, that's not the aesthetic that we want. This yeah. big sort of protruding gorilla kind of gut thing going on. Yeah. So, and now there's the, I think they call it classic physique is the, is the one that's supposed to be more old school. Yeah. More like Arnold stuff. was. Yeah his name Seabum or something like that is the guy that's been winning it he's like the new Arnold I forget his name it's oh, something I, see, I don't follow it close enough but yeah it used to be more in that world okay so from an evolutionary perspective we like abs because it's an indication of basically good metabolic health yeah um leanness flat bellies and leanness in the middle and yep. you know healthy fat accumulation in other parts of the body um the role of the abdominals is primarily as stabilizers to resist undue flexion and extension isometric contractions. So then we get that from training the heavy lifts, the classics, deadlift, press, back squat, accessory movements like planks, farmer carries, yoke carries, Mm -hmm. that sort of thing. If you, and if you looked at like, say a month of our programming and you looked at the number of times we do those movements versus the number of times we do sit-ups, you would see that that ratio is probably 95% the classic stabilizer stuff and 5% flexion, which is about the distribution of the role of the abdominals. They can flex the spine. We train that a little bit, do some sit-ups here and there, maybe Mm V-ups. And then the rest of the time we're working on them as stabilizers. So then once you have abs and they're in there somewhere, how do you make them show? (laughs) And that's that's the thing that people don't really understand is that everybody has abs, Mm -hmm. right? Everybody has abdominals in there. They're in there somewhere. They might even be really big. You never know. (laughs) They're covered in a layer. They're generally covered by a bunch of subcutaneous fat, Mm -hmm. right? And that is the make it or break it as far as like seeing visible abs. Mm -hmm. So we talked already about body fat percentage, right? Yeah. Um, Generally. So you have to get leaner. You got to get leaner. Yeah. So how do we get leaner? (laughs) Well, we did a whole podcast on that at one point, how to get leaner. Yeah. Uh, If you want to listen to that for like another whatever, we probably talked for an hour on how to get leaner. It's the same basic topics we keep circling back to almost every time. So you need to put yourself in a good hormonal state. So like low stress hormones, low cortisol. Cortisol specifically causes you to accumulate fat in your middle. So that's where that like that stress belly yeah. <laughs> comes. So uh, a low stress environment. Was it Charles Polican that did that? That the, 
remember he like was testing like different hormones effects on different areas of mm-hmm. body fat percentage. I think it was like love handles were more insulin resistant stuff and cortisol was more like belly yeah. button fat. He had some theory, some, I don't know that it was particularly scientifically well supported yeah. or just sort of a working theory that he had was like where you accumulated your fat um, indicated some different hormonal yeah. imbalances perhaps. I don't know that it's yeah that well supported, but that was certainly one of his ideas. So low stress environment, less stress helps for sure. Obviously get a good amount of sleep. Mm -hmm. Um, Good amount of sleep helps manage those stress hormones. It helps manage your appetite, helps manage your craving for like quick, easy energy, like sugar and refined carbohydrates and stuff. So good night's sleep. Mm -hmm. So you're building your abs while you sleep. Yeah. And then people have probably heard you say abs are made in the kitchen. Yeah. They're to a point you can't, once you have the abs, you train them, you squat, you deadlift, you do planks they're there. There's no further benefit from the training in terms of making them visible. Mm -hmm. You cannot spot reduce body fat. That is a complete myth. So this whole idea that like, I'm just going to do sit-ups to burn fat in my stomach. Like, nope, (laughs) that's not at all how that works. It's a whole body metabolic process of just being leaner. Yeah. And and generally the way it works is everybody has areas that their body prefers to store body Mm -hmm. fat right it's different from person to person and chances are the part you hate the most about like where you're holding your body fat is your body's favorite spot to do it and that's (laughs) that's like the last one that's going to come off right so like for me it's my love handles like that's that's where my body first puts fat and it's the last to come off sort of thing Mm -hmm. so i can get like fairly lean in in front of my stomach it's my like love handle area that's like the last to go. And it's always like, <laughs> hate those, get them out of here. But it's just, I have to get so lean to get rid of them altogether. Other people, it might be right around your belly button or, mm-hmm. you know, in your butt or in your hips or wherever. Yeah. I've always been quite lean in my middle, even at my heaviest weights. I always had visible abs, but it's my, my thighs. I've always had giant legs. So I always carry lots of weight in my butt and my thighs. So there definitely is somewhat of a genetic component yeah. to it about how, shredded your abs can get yeah so then from a dietary perspective it's just a matter of getting leaner in a healthy hormonal state so not crash dieting that's not going to help that's just going to elevate those stress hormones but the whole six week to abs thing is like no no (laughs) come on i mean maybe if you started if you three pounds from your goal (laughs) yeah you know you probably already had abs if you have them at six yeah so a healthy hormonal state to allow your body to burn more of its own stored energy incorporating, there's lots of different strategies. So intermittent fasting mm-hmm. is a great one. Anything that allows uh, a period of low insulin. So even if you do choose to include some carbohydrate in your diet, if you do that, you just need longer breaks in between. Just like we exercise <coughs> and then recover, we have rest days. S- same thing with your dietary strategies. If you choose to eat carbs or maybe you have a big cheat day, you just need a metabolic rest day. You need a gut rest day yeah. after that. So um, ideal habit 16 hour fasting window, eight hour eating window, minimum 12 hours between your last meal and your first one the next morning. But if you can push that a little smaller, that's ideal. You can incorporate a, you know, 24 hour fast once a week. You can incorporate a little longer fast, like two or three days every quarter. Some people will do seven day fasts a few times a year, you know, so incorporating some fasting has hormonal benefits. Yep. Resets insulin sensitivity. You can... Well, I mean, the most obvious one is just stop eating processed food. Yeah. <laughs> Never drink sugar. So pop, juice, even like sugary alcoholic beverages, just because you add gin doesn't mean you should now have six glasses of juice. <laughs> you know, like that's the one that gets us. So um, no juice, even like smoothies, mm-hmm. right? You don't blend it up pre-chewed so you can suck it back in seven minutes, eat the fruit, chew it. You know, like yeah. anything like that helps slow down the rate that it hits your bloodstream, slows down the insulin response, all that kind of stuff. So no liquid sugar. Um, 100% avoid the processed seed oils, the corn oil, canola, soybean, sunflower, safflower, and then rice bran and grape seed oil tend to be used in restaurants more. Those last two. Avoid the processed seed oils, replace them with healthy, stable, natural fats. Um, so beef tallow, butter, especially from grass-fed animals, ghee, Coconut oil. Um, avocado oil. Yeah, add it. Avocado <laughs> oil is great for like salad dressings and stuff in place of, like if you're going to make your own vinaigrette, olive oil, avocado oil, the fruit fats, mm-hmm. great for um, salad dressings and cold 
things like that. High heat cooking, you probably should use a more stable, more saturated fat like coconut oil yeah. or beef towel or butter or ghee. There's a company, what's the name of it, that makes uh, salad dressings out of avocado oil? Oh, it's Mark Sison's, um Primal Kitchen. There's that one. There's another one too now. That chosen we've seen. Foods. Yeah. yeah. The chosen food ones, like I like ranch dressing on a lot of stuff and it's great. Like it, it tastes like ranch dressing. It's not as like thick as like Hidden Valley Ranch or whatever, but it tastes really good and it's an easy sub. Can I tell a story about ranch dressing? <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> so one time, I think this might have even been at our old house, under the couch, I found a bottle of <laughs> Hidden Valley Ranch dressing. And David was like, don't throw that out. I'll still eat that. <laughs> and I was like, I do not know how long it's been under the couch. He's like, it's fine. It's just full of chemicals anyway. He's like, it's not like it goes bad. And he did still eat the yeah. couch ranch <laughs> Yeah, and you were back. fine, yeah. which is also frightening that it there's frightening. nothing in there that at room temperature for fucking God knows how long <laughs> didn't poison you. <laughs> so. I'm surprised the labels don't say like, please keep refrigerated or not or not whatever. or whatever. <laughs> Leave it out in the sun. It's, <laughs> yeah, fine. it's fine. It's all just preservatives and yeah. chemicals anyway. I used to work in a restaurant industry and like the mayonnaise is like you could like it would, it would outlast cockroaches. Like there was nothing good about <laughs> the mayonnaise. Disgusting. You could leave it out for years and it would be fine. Ugh. You know, it was just like, there's yeah. nothing food about it. Okay. At all. So eat food. Don't eat, eat food. things that are not food. Eat things that go bad. If you leave them under the couch, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> eat things that have mold on them when you find them under the couch, um, focus on protein. Yeah. And by protein, I mean real whole like animal source proteins, red meat, eggs, chicken, pork, fish, you know, your crustaceans and bivalves, all that kind of stuff. Focus on whole sources of protein. Protein helps you feel full. Mm -hmm. It's the most satiating macronutrient. So people that increase the percentage of protein in their diet from just 13 to 15% will spontaneously reduce their caloric intake by 270 calories a day. Mm -hmm. So focus on your protein at every meal. And then something we experimented with in the glucose group was if you eat the protein in your meal first, it will change, it will lower, lessen the blood glucose impact. So it will lower the area under the curve of the glucose impact from whatever carbs you do eat. Right. So get your protein, protein first. Um, Fluid retention is a, a big thing as well, right? Like whenever a bodybuilder or like yeah. a fitness model is going to do a photo shoot, they'll often do like a, you know, flush to get all the extra fluid out. Yeah. So they super dehydrate themselves. Yeah. I don't think we're talking about going to that like no. extreme level of like, no, it's I've not. been there. I've done that with bodybuilding shows and it is not a good situation. Yeah. I don't mean it's that. Hard on the health. It's definitely not what we're shooting for, but there's certain foods that are just like way, like they make me retain fluid. Like if mm -hmm. I have like a big cheat, you know, pizza or something like that on a Saturday night, I feel puffy the next day. Yeah. So those are generally the like refined manufactured processed mm -hmm. foods that cause that like extra level of inflammation and just yeah. like feeling puffy. It'll uh, usually come from like wheat or dairy mm -hmm. if you have, or both, if you have Pizza intolerances, is pizzas, <laughs> both. Yeah. Wheat covered in dairy. And so, yeah, you'll notice it as like some people get like puffy eyes yeah. or like congested in their sinuses. And it's like your skin, even like I find my rings fit tighter Yeah, when it's that just everything is like puffier yeah. in a not so good way. Yeah. So we're focusing on protein. We're not drinking liquid sugar. We're avoiding the processed seed oils. Um, fueling yourself more so with fat doesn't mean no carbs, but be um, judicious in which carbs you do choose to incorporate. Mm -hmm. The less processed, the better. Um, eating more fat will improve your like hormone levels and stuff mm -hmm. as well, right? You don't want to tank your testosterone levels and end up losing a whole bunch of muscle as you're trying to lean out, right? You want to yeah. try to maintain as much as possible. So yeah. all those fat soluble or uh, all the hormones are, mm -hmm. they need fat to Yeah, to fat exist, and cholesterol, right? the building blocks of all your hormones, yeah. all your sex hormones, testosterone, estrogen, all yeah. that kind of stuff. Yeah, so you definitely need to make sure you get the majority of your energy calories from fat. You can sprinkle in a little carbohydrate. If you think of like the balance on a person's body, mm -hmm. this is in my Nutrition 101 course. So I've had a DEXA scan. I can store about 2,000 calories worth of glucose as glycogen, about maybe 400 grams or so in my muscles, and then about 100 grams in my liver. And that's it. So about 2,000 calories. That's barely enough. It's like it's about a day's worth of calories where um, I'm about 15% body fat. So that's 19 pounds of fat on my frame, a nice, healthy, normal amount. Great to keep all my mood and hormones and everything very balanced and stable. 
but that represents 67,200 calories of so stored at least energy. Two days worth. <laughs> at least two days. That's like a month's <laughs> worth of energy for yeah. me to, if, you know, in a starvation condition, I've got plentiful energy stored as fat. Mm -hmm. So fat is the primary, the preferred way that your body stores fuel. It's also the preferred way that your body uses fuel. Most of the time right now we're operating in the oxidative pathway. We're burning majority fatty acids to just like sustain life right, right now. Handful of cells in the body do need some glucose to function, red blood cells and about 30% of your brain, the astrocyte. So there is some on board. There's a small amount of, of glucose needed in the day, but the majority of energy needs can be met from fat. And then fat has the benefit of being hormonally neutral. Fat causes no insulin response, no glucagon response. It just provides this nice clean energy, building blocks for your hormones, integrity of your cell membranes, you know, clean burning fuel, especially your long chain saturated fats. Mm -hmm. They don't generate nearly the same amount of reactive oxygen species, ROS, which is like the primary way that you age your cells is oxidative stress. Damn ROS. Damn ROS. <laughs> and then requires more antioxidants in order to stop the oxidative reactions. And so then it depletes your intercellular antioxidants and just generally makes you worse at repairing or recovering from anything if you're constantly having to deal with your oxidative stress. Yeah. So yeah, primarily fat keeps your cells aging nicely. Um, what about fat burners? How do oh, you feel about fat burners? Good question. Yeah. So that would be like, Caffeine, stimulant type ephedrine, things, ephedrine, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Not like how, do, how do they, like <laughs> how first do of all, let's talk about how they work. Okay. So, um, your fat cell has alpha and beta receptors. Um, the alpha is like the in valve and the beta is like the out. So ephedrine is a beta receptor agonist. So it activates the out valve right. of the fat cells, but it does it through, um, at their stimulants, right. And they'll make people feel like shaky. Mm -hmm. It's sort of activating like a stress hormone response though, like yeah. hypothalamic pituitary access, HPA access. Um, so they will work. They will allow you to liberate and, you know, mm -hmm. more free fatty acids out of your adipose tissue, but at potentially great adrenal health cost, right. cardiac health cost, heart on the heart. Yeah heart on the adrenal glands. It's sort of like a living in a high stress, like go, 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 go environment, except you're stimulating it yeah. um, exogenously. And ephedrine is now technically illegal to sell as a fat burner. Not, used, in, not in Canada. Well, you can sell it in eight milligram doses as a nasal decongestant, oh. but you're not allowed to have more than eight milligrams in one like pill. Mm -hmm. So to get like the, the fat burning sort of you know, benefits of it. I think you need to take something like 30 milligrams or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so it used to be, I remember like way back in our like bodybuilding yeah. days that we had these things called red rockets. Oh God. <laughs> and you would take these things and you would just be like jittering and like, you yeah. know, tweaking out, man. It was like, there's probably meth in there. Um, but they had a whole bunch of ephedrine and caffeine and whatever else in there. They've now like banned that type of supplements. Yeah. Um, but there are, you know, you can just buy eight milligram pills of ephedrine and take a yeah. bunch of them or whatever. Um, in the U S you cannot buy ephedrine yeah. in Canada. You can, and they sell it as an oral nasal decongestant. Yeah. Um, they banned it in the States because people were using it to make meth. Oh really? Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, I mean, there's lots of, there's lots of things that will make you lose weight, mm -hmm. but that does not equal healthy. Yeah. Right. Chemotherapy will make you lose weight. Meth will make you lose weight. Mm -hmm. Right. Things can get you lean, but we're, you know, the caveat here is we're talking about ways to get lean without sacrificing your yeah. overall health or longevity. Right? It's kind of like taking a shortcut, right? It's like, yeah, it's going to work, but it's not necessarily the, the most sustainable, like best mm -hmm. route. I think the big thing people have to remember is that it probably took you years and years and years to accumulate whatever level of body fat you mm -hmm. have. It's going to take some time. Yeah, you know, to, to get to safely and effectively get rid of it permanently. Mm -hmm. When people do the like biggest loser crash diets, it's like, yeah, you lose a whole bunch of weight super fast. But this, the second you stop that kind of lifestyle, you go straight back to where you were, you know, mm -hmm. you need to give your body time to reach that homeostasis again and be like comfortable with the, the weight loss and, and all of that. Mm -hmm. Obviously I'm a big fan advocate of <clears throat> high fat diets, but I always try to be really um, cautious in recommending that, that not all fats are created equal. Yeah. Um, some like trans fats 
are so wholly toxic and, you know, atherogenic and cancer causing that now they've been like banned from the food system. And then you have the like high omega-6, like all the processed seed oils that I've been harping on for ages, high in linoleic acid, which is a polyunsaturated. So if you've never taken biochemistry, chains of carbons, and they should have, each carbon should have two hydrogen stuck on it, sort of like a long banquet table. Mm -hmm. And there's no empty chairs in a saturated fat, very stable. In a poly or in a monounsaturated fat, there's one double bond between the carbons. So there's a, a hydrogen like missing, there's an empty chair. And then in a polyunsaturated fats, there's more than, there's two or more double bonds. So those double bonds are highly vulnerable to oxygen, mm -hmm. to oxidizing, to oxygen crashing the party yeah. <laughs> at the dinner table. And then the oxidized polyunsaturated fats are a whole cascade of like super negative effects in the body. And then the fully saturated fats. And again, there's like all these different chain links. And um, so there's the medium chain triglycerides, the MCT, like MCT oil is mostly an eight carbon chain called caprylic acid. Um, shorter chains are more water soluble. So caprylic acid, the C8 MCT um, doesn't have to get packaged in a little carrier molecule out of your digestive system. It can go right through the portal vein to the liver and it gets turned rapidly into ketone bodies. So that's why the bulletproof coffee, MCT oil in the coffee, that's what that's for, rapid elevation of, of ketones to fuel your mostly your brain. Mm -hmm. um, the long chain saturated fats, particularly an 18 carbon chain called um, steric acid, has some unique properties in its ability to initiate what's called metabolic uncoupling, which is sort of a reverse, it like reverses the electron transport chain and causes you to waste energy as heat. So it elevates your body temperature. So it makes you, you're just like burning more fuel all the time. And what you notice is you're warmer. So body temperature, I think we talked about that in a previous podcast is, can be an indicator of low metabolism mm -hmm. and an increase in body temperature can be not hundred percent because you can have increases in body temperature from all kinds of stuff. But, um, a general trend towards an increasing body temperature can be a good, can be a good thing. Right. There was an attempt to create some pharmaceutical drugs that initiate metabolic uncoupling, but they couldn't figure out with pills how to stop it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so people would die yeah. of seizures, strokes, or hy hyperthermia. They would get too hot. The process would, they, it would be a runaway process and they couldn't stop it. Yeah. Where it was promising in that it did, it does cause you to, to burn more fat and just burn more calories overall. Um, but they couldn't figure out how to do it with pills yeah. <laughs> safely. There's, there's a drug that I don't remember the name of that a bunch of bodybuilders, like young bodybuilders were taking cause it made them like super lean, mm -hmm. but they died like, yeah. yeah. Like Z's. Do you remember Z's? He was a super, uh, okay. internet famous guy super. for a while. Yeah. yeah. He died really young. He died super young, mm -hmm. but was like crushing. Apparently he died because he was was taking Tren, which is apparently like a super hardcore drug year round and you're not supposed to do that. And he was taking whatever that other drug was that helped burn fat. Mm -hmm. um, and he had some sort of like pre-existing condition. He was in a sauna on these drugs and doing cocaine <laughs> with <What>? some girls. <laughs> yeah. And he died. It's like, yeah, that, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, he took all the risks yeah, all at once and didn't work out. Yeah. yeah, so we're not talking about that, that's for sure. <laughs> Don't do none of that. Don't do none this. of that stuff. Don't do that. Actually, stuff. you can sit in a sauna. You can sit. Sauna's yeah, sauna is fine. <laughs> yeah. As long as you don't have pre-existing conditions, it's true. heart conditions yeah. or whatever. Yeah. No pregnant ladies, no heart conditions yeah. in the sauna. Okay. So the types of fats. So stearic acid is in high concentrations in beef tallow, cocoa butter. Um, those are two really good sources of stearic acid. I actually have supplemental stearic acid and I'll add it to different, like to my coffee or mm -hmm. baking. It's quite a, it's quite a waxy yeah. fat. It's the texture of it is a little bit odd, um, but it does really help increase your metabolism. Obviously we've talked over and over again about uh, workout with intensity, yeah. which is both lifting heavy and sprinting. Both <laughs> of those things equal higher power output. The more muscle mass you have, muscle is metabolically active tissue. Yeah. You burn more calories all day long. Yep. So you don't have to do things like tons of long, slow, shitty cardio, which God, I spent so many hours at Gold's gym in Calgary doing elliptical machine and yep. shit like that. Thinking I was burning fat when I just needed to lift heavy and eat well. And I didn't need to waste my time yep. 
you know, in the oxidative pathway, stressing my cells doing, <laughs> doing that. It's funny because all the traditional bodybuilder things is right. Like you get up and you do your early morning LSD, long, slow distance cardio, right? Um, and it's like, yes, you're, you're burning fuel, you're burning calories, but there is very little control over like where those cal- like where that's coming from. Right. So, um, you can be burning a little bit of fat and burning a little bit of muscle and you're like slowly getting smaller, which is why like marathon runners tend to be really like, you know, small, emaciated, and emaciated. Um, and then the bodybuilders will like swear by it, be like, no, this is what you got to do. But then it's like, they're taking exogenous hormones to preserve mm-hmm. their muscle mass. And yeah. the people that aren't are just getting smaller from doing this like long cardio stuff. Mm-hmm. So it's like, yes, if you kind of like use ex- accessory things, it's going to make it more effective. But for those of us that don't do that kind of thing, it's mm-hmm. more detrimental than it is helpful. Yeah. I think now there is a shift or maybe a bit more of a divide in the world of bodybuilding where there definitely are the ones that have realized that you can get very lean and preserve your muscle mass with, they're basically doing carnivore diets. Yeah. Red meat, like meat and fat. Red meat has a bunch of um, nutrients in particular that help you burn more fat. So L-carnitine is, um, you'll see it as a supplement pretty often, but L-carnitine is needed in the process, the beta oxidation of fatty acids. You need that and it can be a rate limiter to burning fat. So you need carnitine. Um, I think we talked about this in another one the other mm-hmm. day. Carne means like meat, like carne asada, yeah. <laughs> you know, um, and it's found in red meat in particular. So if you eat more red meat and you get more iron and B12 and all these things that help with your like cellular energy metabolism. So help you feel more energetic so that you can keep lifting heavy and sprinting. You have the energy while you're leaning out. Mm-hmm. I would say the, well, I'm going to say number one sign of a poor weight loss diet is if you're getting weaker. Yeah. That should not be a given that if you're losing weight, that you also have to lose muscle and strength. For sure. That's a symptom or a sign of shitty dieting. Mm -hmm. You're dieting with too much carbohydrate and not enough protein, not enough red meat and long chain saturated fats. You absolutely can lose a lot of weight and zero muscle if you diet properly. That's well supported in the literature. I've seen um, studies on elite artistic gymnasts on Olympic weightlifters and powerlifters using um, like animal-based ketogenic diets to lean out or make their weight class, like for weightlifters and stuff. And they can drop an entire weight class down, but lose no um, weight off their lifts. So they perform the same, but they get to be in a lighter weight class. And then like by DEXA scan, no loss of, of lean body mass. Right. So sweet. Yeah. Yeah. So number one sign that you're on a crappy weight loss diet would be if your lifts are going down. Yeah. Shouldn't have to happen like that. And then uh, leucine, which is an amino acid, is the most anabolic. So you need to make sure you're getting a lot of leucine, which guess where we get leucine from? Meat. Animals. <laughs> meat. <laughs> yeah. Meat and eggs, basically. So um, that's why I'm always an advocate of like any plant-based proteins. They just, those ones don't count. Yeah. If you're going to, if you're trying to hit a specific protein target, any little bits of protein that you see on a label that came from like wheat or nuts or whatever, those ones don't get to count as part of the total. And even if you are supplementing with that kind of stuff, it's still, we're still not a hundred percent sure whether the like bioavailability of supplementing is as good as, you know, eating it from its original source. And I think pretty clearly supplements are never going to be as good as something in its original source. There's just such complexity in the food matrix and the way things are packaged and, you know, delivered in combination with other vitamins and minerals and amino acids and fatty acids and all these things that like, we're supposed to eat real food. We're not supposed to rely on supplements. Those are like a belt, (laughs) an accessory, a little add on that can help fill in some gaps here and there, Mm -hmm. depending on, you know, your diet and your food sources and everything. But the bulk of it needs to come from real food. Right. Yeah. Um, so yeah, if you want to get lean, See in those which, abs, which you need to do to get <laughs> if you want to see if you want to see your abs yeah. and you want to get leaner. It's reduced eating window, reduced processed foods, so no uh, vegetable oils, no liquid sugar. Um, focus on protein at every meal, especially like the high nutrient, like red meat protein, liver. You guys know I would love it if you eat more <laughs> liver. <laughs> um, egg yolks, egg yolks, yeah, all that kind of stuff. If you like green leafy vegetables, feel free to incorporate them. A lot of people will feel better if they don't um, from that bloating Mm -hmm. perspective. um, Careful with the fiber. Don't overdo it with fiber. There's no dietary requirement in the human body for fiber. Um, Some people can 
tolerated and find it gives them better gut health. Some people find it makes it substantially worse. Yep. So that's a experiment for yourself kind of thing. Mm-hmm. If you do want to incorporate something sweet here and there, make it like whole fruits, especially like seasonal when they're really good at like peak flavor and freshness. Mm-hmm. Um, and then get the bulk of your energy needs from good sources of fat. Yeah. Butter, ghee, beef tallow, coconut oil. Shout out to uh, Pagan Pantry, the butcher shop we have here in Saskatoon. They have great, um, I get liters of beef tallow and lard Mm -hmm. from them and they render it right there. And they show the map on their website of like the farms that they source from around Saskatoon. So super great business. I really love what they do. Um, They don't pay me to say that. I just like them. (laughs) They make good meat. (laughs) They do all kinds of cool stuff there. Yeah. So you want abs? You got to lift heavy, lift heavy, you know, throw in a little bit of like abdominal movement, but don't overdo it. Yeah. Um, excessive cardio is not the answer. Mm. It's more about nutrition. Mm-hmm. You got to eat the right kind of food so that your body naturally wants to lean out yep. and hold less fat and then they'll start to pop through. And then if that doesn't work, just draw them on. That's I've like seen, Janet Jackson. Yeah. Just, or there's like a color them on. bracket thing you can pull on. <laughs> makes it look. I s- squish yourself up against a chain link fence. <laughs> <laughs> works like a charm every time you know what's the yeah. fr- most frustrating thing about like from an evolutionary standpoint is like fruits and stuff they're like very good at like going into body fat for storage for mm-hmm. later right? fructose yeah. right? fructose so um when it's summertime that's when we're supposed to be bulking right like that's when we're supposed to be fattening up for the winter yeah but that's when you want to be the leanest because you're like beach body, beach body right <laughs> so you're from the evolutionary standpoint, we're supposed to bulk in the summer and be le- and leaning out in the winter, but yeah. we want it to be the opposite. We're so like we're, the leanest in February when you're just in yeah. your sweater bod. No one <laughs> can appreciate can see it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, from the training perspective, about 95% stabilizing, about 5% flexion. Yeah. And then the rest of it really comes from the old. It's all food. From the old diet. Do you know what we didn't talk about? What? Beer. Yeah. The beer gut. Sorry, guys, but uh, <laughs> bad news. Bad news. Beer is like uniquely fattening to your middle, the visceral fat, similar to fructose. Yeah. So like the beer belly is literally is a, a thing. A thing. Yeah. Where that comes from is, and this is um, Dr. Richard Johnson, researcher at um, Colorado State University. Super interesting guy. Fructose is his like primary um, area of expertise. So fructose breaks down into what's called purines, which breaks down into uric acid. So does the little, the breakdown of the DNA from the yeast in beer. And they both end up as uric acid. Uric acid is a signal from nature, basically, that it's time to accumulate fat. So it, it sets off a whole cascade of things that like lower cellular energy. So you, you don't want to move around as much. It makes you feel less energetic, increases fat storage, and particularly around the middle. Mm-hmm. So it's sort of a preparing for... Um, bad times, (laughs) kind of preparing for winter to survive. Um, And so they call it a fat switch. He wrote his second book was called The Fat Switch. His most recent one is called Nature Wants Us to Be Fat, (laughs) which is, it's uh, the processes that are triggered by fructose and then also linoleic acid has some of the, omega-6 has some of the similar effects. Um, That's a perfectly normal, natural thing that you would want to happen in the late summer and fall if you had to survive the winter, of course, but it's just that those periods of, let's call it bulking, is supposed to be accompanied by a long period of fasting, leaning out, of yeah. fasting. Winter, we're in Saskatchewan. Go outside in January. What would you eat if you lived outside? Something you killed. Not blueberries, yeah. not oats. Like, you'd find an animal. That's all that you would have available would be protein and fat. And then and then that would be it until the next season. So the incorporation of carbohydrate, especially as humans early humans were able to migrate out of like the equatorial, like Africa where they had fruit available all the time. The only way we were able to survive and proliferate to all these other parts of the world was because we can accumulate fat in the presence of fructose and linoleic acid seeds, basically the presence of seeds and fruit allows us to get fat so we can survive in cold climates. Yeah. So beer is a a gaining food. Yeah. And then bread too. That's the yeast from bread does the same thing. So, so if it's summertime coming up, people are going to want to have some, some drinks, a better option that we've played around with because spirits like hard liquors tend Mm -hmm. to be like the least, you know, amount of excessive calories and whatever. Um, There's no yeast in them is like element margaritas. Oh, I got real obsessed with this last summer. Yeah. Yeah. The element, like it's magnesium, 
potassium and sodium. sodium. So you're getting electrolytes in there, which are going to help like keep you hydrated and yeah. alcohol is notorious for dehydrating you. And that's why you get hungover. Yeah. Um, it's way less, you know, food, way less calories. Mm -hmm. They no taste sugar. The no sugar. They taste great. Yeah. So if you're gonna, if you're gonna do it, you know, do it that way. Yeah. It honestly prevents hangovers for me. It's crazy. That was part of the problem last summer. I'm not a big drinker yeah. because I hate feeling like shit. It's the same reason I don't eat like garbage all the time. I just like to feel good. Yeah. So I don't like drinking cause I don't like to not feel good. Um, but then we discovered the element margaritas and I, the next day I would feel fine. And I was like, Oh, I'm not suffering any negative <laughs> consequences. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. It's like still overall, not a great idea. Yeah. But, and, I'm pretty uh, sure, and like, I love tequila. So yeah. tequila, this was the recipe. What would we do? Six ounces of tequila, three ounces of triple sec. Which per margarita. Per, just yeah, no, it's like a pitcher. <laughs> yeah. And then um, two cans of like a bubbly water. So you could make it whatever flavor you want. If you want to do the lime ones and then a lime element, yeah. we would do two, two elements. elements yeah. Or um, what would we do? Plain fizzy water, soda water with like the, the grapefruit mango. ones. Oh, that yeah. was super good. Or the mango. The uh, mango chili is yeah. awesome. Yeah. Love that one in the margarita where it's got a little bit of that like sweet and spicy thing going on. I swear the flavors they chose for elements are are based purely around <laughs> what kind <laughs> of cocktail you can make with it. And it, so the saltiness goes really well with the yeah. margarita thing, right? Because yep. that's like usually how it goes together. So not that I'm promoting drinking more, but if you're going, if you're going to, yeah, and try then, to avoid the beer, which I get it. Uh, David They're loves delicious. a good beer. I love yeah. a good beer. That's a better alternative. It is a better alternative. So it's like mostly water and salt. Yeah. A little bit of your alcohol and some flavor yeah. in there. So it's the. And they taste good. At least terrible. Especially if you're sitting outside in the summer. Yeah. And you're like hot and sweating too. Like you said, the dehydration is like damaging and also part of what makes you feel like garbage the next yeah. day. Um, at some point we'll do a whole podcast on alcohol. Mm. <laughs> It'll just be a real bummer. It'll just be sad. <laughs> <laughs> It'll just be a real bummer. Um, so yes, laying off. The yeasty products, the beer and bread also yep. helps you get leaner in the middle. Yeah, for sure. So go guys. Best S of luck with your abs. Six minute abs. Let's do it. <laughs> Beach pod time's coming up. <laughs> awesome. Thanks. All right, see you in the next one. See you guys.